Thank you for listening and supporting The Daily Memphian. Sign up for one of our many free newsletters and breaking news alerts at dailymemphian.com slash email to receive the latest local news stories impacting our community. Our weekly newsletters cover everything from sports to arts and culture, business, food, and more, along with daily updates of all the news we publish each day. Sign up or manage your email preferences at dailymemphian.com slash email. Hi, everyone. Welcome to this week's Daily Memphian Tigers podcast with Greg Gaston. I'll be joined in just a moment by Parth Upajai, who's the Tigers basketball beat writer for the Daily Memphian, Tim Buckley from the Daily Memphian, their deputy sports editor and senior writer. Oh, by the way, we've not forgotten Frank Bonner, Tigers football beat writer for the DM. He will be joining us here in the coming weeks as we get closer to the start of spring football. But there is some football to talk about, and I'll get Tim's thoughts in just a second. I want to remind everybody that the four of us are in four different locations, so the audio may not sound as crisp as it has done in the past or it has sounded in the past. Parth, Tim, myself, and our producer, Natalie Van Gundy, in four different spots. So I hope you understand that. Obviously, Tigers basketball first and foremost. But, Tim, as I mentioned, a little bit of Memphis Tigers football news Right off the bat, first of all, some positive news. Ryan Silverfield was named the Tennessee Sports Writers Association Coach of the Year for the second time, and Seth Hennigan was named the TSWA Player of the Year, culminating in that 10-win season with that AutoZone Liberty Bowl victory. Nice to reap the benefits of a great season. Yeah, it's always nice when your work is recognized, and deservedly so after 10 wins. Uh, It's certainly... uh, more impressive than a player of the week <laughs> whole year thing. I, I, you know, it's probably not, you know, a, a paper certificate or a ribbon. It might be an upgrade to an actual plaque. Um, I've actually seen contracts, seriously, uh, uh, coaching contracts for like a state award coach of the year thing. That's like a $25,000 bonus. Um, I don't know if that's written into Ryan Silverfield's contract or not, but I mean, 25 in the pocket, that would be nice. You could actually afford, you know, the barbecue nachos and a bottle of water at FedEx Forum with $25,000. And, you know, if it's 25 or whatever it is for for Silverfield, if it's anything on an NIL deal, deal, it's probably worth, you know, another million or two, I'm sure, for for Seth Hennigan. Um, But no, no, seriously, it's like 10 wins. Yeah, they they deserve a nod. that's, That's for certain. Tomorrow is National Signing Day, but it's not like it used to be years ago when February was the big signing day. We have the early signing period now in December where most teams have put together their rosters. Of course, we have the portal that will reopen after spring football. There'll be more movement. So I don't know if there's going to be much fireworks when it comes to the Tigers tomorrow. As of the moment, uh, from my understanding, and, and actually we got something up online if you want to read the detailed uh, bios of the current commits, um, it looks like they might be signing only one high school commit, pretty highly recruited uh, D-back out of Florida, who at one point uh, was committed to Florida State, although he decommitted from them, I think it was back in April, uh, by the name of Chalil Cummings. Um Looks like that could be the only high school uh, uh, guy that they that they end up announcing. Because I mean, let's be real this is this is old school National Signing Day. That everything, almost everything, gets done in December, and this is just uh, plugging a few of the, the 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 remaining holes that there are. My favorite thing about Chalil Cummings is that when you do a screen grab grab of his uh, commitment announcement, it's actually a picture of Elvis Presley, uh, which you can see. Serious. Yeah, yeah, go on to the Daily Memphian <laughs> and uh, open up the uh, the little tracker I just did. It's awesome. Um, and then they got three that picked up out of the portal that it looks like they're going to sign, at least uh, currently committed or reported as committed. Uh, they have a uh, another D-back, a safety uh, out of Old Dominion by the name of uh, Taj Rael, um, who – 
had committed to West Virginia over Cincinnati back in January, and then a day later committed to Memphis. Uh, so the Tigers flipped them. Um, it'll be interesting to see the back story on that one if uh, if Ryan Silverfield talks about it. Um, but obviously, as you can see, somebody who was commanding Power Five offers that uh, that the Tigers managed to land. And then quickly, uh, a couple of others. Interestingly, both played at the same Charlotte High School, although they played different places in college. Big offensive lineman, and I say big, I think 318 pounds, six foot five qualifies as big. Yes. By the name of Jalen Nichols, um, who had, uh, I think it was 18 starts for them over five seasons, so a part-time starter. Uh, but... Uh, he missed all of last season. He tore up a knee in spring ball last year, missed all the year. But look, they got a lot of holes to plug on that old line. So uh, uh, that, you know, could end up being an answer. And he's somebody who's really versatile too. He's played multiple uh, multiple spots on the line. Uh, interestingly, he did not tweet out a commitment like a lot of these guys do, you know, committed to the Memphis Tigers. Mm-hmm. Uh, he tweeted out his 901 fund uh, commitment. Read into it what you will. Uh, and the other one from that same Charlotte High School, Jordan Greer, Jordan Greer, excuse me, another D-back, uh, also a safety, uh, speaking to, you know, the depth issues that the Tigers have to fill as safety, especially with Simeon Blair, their, their portal pickup out of Arkansas, uh, being one and done last season. Uh yeah, he played uh he played all 12 games. Um uh started a few uh at Indiana last year. So at a minimum uh, uh you know some depth in the in the Tigers secondary there with Jordan Greer. It looks like. All right, and as Tim said, we'll have you updated with anything that's happening with the University of Memphis football program with Frank Bonner, with Tim and the rest of the great folks at the Daily Memphian. Now let's bring in The basketball extraordinaire, Mr. Parth Upajai. And for the Memphis Tigers last week, a loss to Rice, which was crippling, 74 to 71. The last time we spoke to you good folks was the day before that game. Tigers then went on Saturday to end their four-game slide, nipping Wichita State 65-63 on a David Jones jumper with 2.8 seconds to go. Tigers were down 14 at that point, or actually down 14 with eight minutes to play before rallying to win. So the good news part is they got off the schneid. They got a dub. The bad news is they lost to Rice. They lost four or five, and they are absolutely on the outside of the tournament looking in. Yeah, it's still a tough spot to be in. And I, you know, I mentioned that briefly in in my game story and tweeted that out as well. Like, you know, the win is great, right? They were down 14 with eight minutes to go. Things were looking bad. Um, you know, it would have been the first five game losing streak since the 99, 2000 season under interim, you know, interim coach, Johnny Jones. Um, so it would have been history, right? Second time this century that that would have happened. So obviously you'll take the win. Um, and Penny's right, man. Like the, the fashion in which they won, obviously Wichita state is a one win AAC team. So he's not talking about just getting the two point win over the shockers, but to be able to be down, you know, already have that weight right of the four game losing streak and, and rally back with 755 to go um and have a 16 point swing to win that that's awesome um but greg to your point you know they can't afford any more bad losses i feel like you know one more bad loss and you're probably done for an at large bid they've got nine games left um you know it's hard to say exactly what they need to do but i've i've predicted that they have to go eight and one with that lone loss it can't be you know it can't be temple you know it can't be ecu um, it probably has to be either one of the FAU games, you know, one of the one at home, one on the road, um, or SMU or North Texas next week. I think you're spot on about that part, but we'll talk more about what the Tigers really need to do, in our opinion, a little bit later on in the podcast. But I, I did want to ask Tim this. The half full fan would look at it and say, hey, the last eight minutes of that game against Wichita State, that's the way the Tigers – played earlier in the year, maybe they'll go on this run and start playing great basketball again. The half empty, maybe even the three-quarter empty would say they beat Wichita State easily on the road not too long ago. They barely get by them this time. They have lost four previous games, including a game to Rice, and they are out of the mix right now 
I don't see any hope despite them winning that game and pulling it off in the end. How do you think, in your opinion, Tigers fans should be looking at the situation? Well, uh, I'll break that down. But first of all, uh, kudos to Greg for working both Schneid and Dub into the same sentence <laughs> on the question to part. I did not have a single sentence Schneid Dub on my bingo bingo card going into this. Um, look, the 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 half empty part. At this point, you can't afford to be picky. I mean, you take anything you can get. It doesn't matter whether it's a one win in the conference team or somebody that you beat handily early in the season, whatever. You just had a win. You had to get off the losing streak. You had to get in the right frame of mind and turn it around. Yes, the skeptics will point out, oh, big deal. They beat Wichita State, uh, whatever. But um, at this point, something's better than nothing. Right. The half, the half full part of it, and even Penny Hardaway himself said after the game, he says, uh, I'll I'll take those last eight minutes, <laughs> um, which, you know, which is what you have to build off of. I mean, I was sitting there during those last uh, eight minutes sitting there thinking mostly to myself because Parth moved to the other side because Parth doesn't want to sit near me anymore. So, <laughs> you know, he, he he's a cool guy. He, he goes sits with the cool kids to the left. Um, the cool table, the cool kids table. I yes, understand, yes, yes. but okay. <laughs> I'm at the old people table to the right. So um, Parth would I agree, I think that, look, the the defense, I'm sitting there going, who are these guys? Like, that was the defense that you saw when they were, when they were knocking off the nationally ranked teams, Texas A&M, Clemson, Virginia. It was like they were playing real defense. It was the team that was totally absent during, during the winning streak. And it was like, man, if they can play and turn it on that easily, to me, it's not what they've been taught or it's not, you know, what they're doing, you know, uh, scheme wise or what defense they're in or whatever. That's just all will and want to. They had the will and the want to. They showed it and they did it. So you build off of that. And then I think you build off of, look, no matter what sort of tensions it might create or whatever, get the ball in David Jones's hands and just let him go play basketball. You build off of that and you build off of Javon Quinterly is not going to go 0 for 12 until he hits his first shot every game the rest of the way. So if all of a sudden you add normal Javon Quinterly shooting into all of this, you're going into the into the stretch run based on those last eight minutes feeling awfully good about yourselves. Parth, your reaction to that? Yeah, I agree. It's not about looking at like the total body, if you will, right? Like of what they did against Wichita State. Because if you look at that, it's still not great. You know, they were down 14 at home to, um, you know, a bottom feeder in the AAC but if you want to look at that glass half full, that optimistic type of um, viewpoint, you know, what Tim said is absolutely right. You know, they were they were down once again, they were down 14 with less than eight minutes to go. They rallied back. They flipped a switch. They actually gave effort, man, like for the first time in, in seemingly weeks. So if they can carry that forward, um, they have the capability and the talent, certainly to make a run. Penny also went small ball. Malco was not in the game for that stretch. They played really well defensively, as you mentioned, Tim. There were a couple of lapses. Wichita State had an opportunity to get a layup, and they they blew a layup. But for the most part, I'm, I'm in agreement with you guys that we saw some intensity on defense that we have not seen in a while. Is it a coincidence that Malco wasn't in there? And Malco's playing the best ball of his career, so don't get me wrong. Do we – Parth, do, are we going to see more of that moving forward? Yeah, if you take Penny at face value, then then yes, we'll see more of that going forward. That's something he said in the post game in his post game remarks that um, the reason he you know played that front court duo of Naquan Tomlin and Nicholas Jordan is because you know they had success going small when Caleb Mills was still active, right? Like in that non conference stretch when they were beating the likes of Texas A and M, Clemson, Virginia. You know, they often they played, you know, Javon Quinterly, David Jones, Jaquan Walton and Caleb Mills on the floor at the same time with one big. And that big was usually, you know, Nicholas Jordan and Malcolm in spurts before he really turned it on um, in January. So I think in terms of defensive flexibility, in terms of being able to switch everything, um, those are the two guys you want out there. But I certainly think Malcolm, you know, should and deserves to be part of that rotation um, because of his efforts, you know, um, protecting the rim and rebounding. Tim? Interesting, interesting, interesting. Yeah, look, the whole small ball thing, um, 
Yeah, they were successful with it, especially during that stretch when when Jordan Brown was gone and, and Aquan Tomlin had not even arrived yet. They went they went four and zero in with that circumstance. I think the biggest thing, let's be frank about it, is uh, when when Malcolm Dandridge is not out there with uh, Quinterly and Jones, uh, there's much less drama on the floor. True. Um, and and I think that makes a difference. And I think they all made veiled references to that. There was one other game this season when when Malcolm wasn't used, you know, down the stretch, or at least there was the the reference from Penny that he couldn't play certain combinations uh down the stretch. And I think the whole Dandridge factor, you know, is a part of all of that. But but the kid also is playing his heart out. They just they just got to all get on the same page because um, they're they're not there at at this point when 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 Malcolm Dandridge, Javon Quinterly, and David Jones are all on the floor together and throw in Jaquan Tomlin too. Um, Jaquan Walton, you mean? Jaquan. Uh, uh, Walton. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Oh, uh, Jaquan. Yeah, yeah. Look, and Nick Jordan, Nicholas Jordan. Um, he, you know, it seems like he can mix in with anybody. I think part of it's going to depend on matchups. You got to keep Dandridge as part of the rotation. I think who you finish with is is who's hot, what the matchups are, who's not in a bad mood that day, who's not arguing with everybody else, and what's your most effective lineup. But I think the biggest part of all of it is, and and I don't want to you know, jump ahead of you, Greg, but Hearth referenced it today. Tighten the rotation. You go with your best five. Um, if, if it means, you know, some of the lessers have a lot more bench time, so be it. But but ride the tight rotation. There is no question. We're all in agreement. Probably everybody in the city is in agreement. When they see 11 guys playing in the first 10 minutes of a contest, it makes no sense. But – there is something over the last two games that is a little worrisome. The offense, which has not been a problem for the most part this year, last two games against Rice, 22 first half points. Against Wichita State, 24 first half points. Why the slow starts? Now, I know Quinterly didn't have a shot going against Wichita State. That wasn't the situation against Rice. Parth, why do you think they're getting off the slow starts? And would you adjust who starts the game? But you guys talked about shortening the rotation. Yeah, and maybe I'm oversimplifying it, but I think against Rice, you know, it's just a matter of they tried to switch things up drastically by throwing Jonathan Pierre in the starting lineup. I'm trying to think of what other changes they made, right? They made two or three Tomlin changes. started right. in the game, yes. That was yeah, the first and they had Jaquan Walton initiating the offense, which is, I think, strange and obviously right. work. Um, so I think that's a part of it. Like, they didn't set the tone against Rice and they paid the price. Um, but then against Wichita State, I thought the quality of shots they took weren't – they weren't horrific. They weren't just, you know, jacking from NBA range three-point – you know, mm-hmm. three-point territory there. Just um, weren't making them. Just weren't making them. And I think – I didn't go back and watch the broadcast, but the CBS Sports broadcast even had, like, a, a shot quality meter that, that showed that Memphis, you know, in terms of whatever algorithm they use, had better quality of shots than Wichita State – They just weren't going in, right? And you're going to have those type of games, but it's hard to afford those type of games going back to the first conversation we had about margin for error. You know, at this point, they've put themselves in a position where, you know, one of those games could derail this whole thing and, you know, end their NCAA tournament at large bid dreams. So it's a tough balance, right? One thing, thing, Greg, if I could interject that I have noticed is um, Quinterly – when he's out for long stretches, late and long stretches, he looks gassed, which is an indication of one of two things. He's just playing like crazy and literally leaving it all out there, um, or he's not in optimal shape. Um, maybe it's a combination of both. I don't know what it is, but also – David Jones never gets gassed. It seems like he has a motor that that just runs. Quinterly, you can see it. He bends over. He tugs at the shorts. He's he's huffing and puffing. Um, I'm not saying that as a negative. It's just an observation. And Malcolm, obviously, t- and naturally being a big guy, tires uh, quickly with the pace of play when they're when they're really you know got the transition game going and and, and the up and down pace going. Um, so I think then it becomes 
incumbent on, on Penny Hardaway to, if you are going to make your substitutions, um, do them wisely and use your timeouts wisely. Um, because there's times when you can just look at Quinterly and say, that kid needs a blow. Um, and I'm not talking a five minute sit on the bench blow, you know, a, a 30 second timeout or a, a quick offense defense, which they do a lot of uh, sub in sub out with him late in, in late game situations, cool. offense defense. So um, just, just some observations there. Well, I think you're right. And this is where I, I really expected more from Jalen young. And I'm not so sure he has the confidence in Jalen young, but I look at him Parth as a guy that could give Quinterly the blow. Uh, he's a probably their second best ball handler. Uh, he makes some erratic passes at times and he's not a prolific offensive player, but that's the guy who needs to step up to give Quinterly some time. So uh, it, it, you wouldn't mind responding to that, but also I want to know how short the rotation should be in your opinion. Yeah. So let's start with that, like rotation size. I think that will answer the first question naturally. I think it should be eight guys. Like that's what, most college basketball teams play, right? They play seven or eight guys for the majority of the game. You just don't see, you know, high-level college basketball, elite-level college basketball teams playing 11, 12 guys. It's not normal. Um, there's a reason it's not normal. It's not effective, right? So I think the five that we named that closed the game um, against Wichita State on Saturday, that would be, you know, just to run through it again, Javon Quinterly, Jaquan Walton, David Jones, Nicholas Jordan, and Naquan Tomlin, those five, and, you know, like Tim alluded to, you could – you know, between Nicholas Jordan, Naquan Tomlin, and Malcolm Dandridge, you can kind of um, pair those however you want based on matchups. So Malcolm's going to be part of that mix. That's six. Then you've got Jalen Young, you know, to give Quinterly a blow when he needs it as a backup point guard. And and Jaden Hardaway. We know Jaden Hardaway is going to play. Um, and, you know, he's he's had a kind of a rocky year so far. But I think there is value in his, you know, veteran leadership um, and kind of what he brings to the program from that aspect. So I think those eight guys should be it. Um, with, you know, Carl Sherenfont, Jonathan Pierre, and Ashton Hardaway, and even Jordan Brown, quite frankly, only playing um, when you've got a certain margin, right? Like a certain cushion very late in the second half. I think they suffer a little bit from, no matter how great of a point guard any team has, you have to have somebody who can play at not necessarily the same level, but but not a significant drop-off. And and right now they have I think a bigger drop off mm -hmm. than is ideal when when Quinterly is out of the game um, because you know Young will bring it on the defensive end but the offense doesn't quite run the same and like Parth alluded to earlier the whole Jay Kawan Walton initiating the offense thing just looks uh, clunky at best um, and then and then to Parth's point although he didn't quite say it this way. Don't play everybody and their brother literally in this yeah. case. I, I kind of go. I kind of know where you're going there, Tim. Oh, I, I yeah, everybody, oh. And brother. Yeah. Look, those okay. guys deserve minutes. Over my head, Sheriff and and Ashton Hardaway and Pierre, they deserve minutes absolutely. But but not when you're in a in a four game losing streak and and you're you know you're down to teams that should be up. Digit, double digits over in the last five minutes like it, it just it, it doesn't it, and even the whole the whole helter skelter um you know like parts that 11 guys see the floor in the first five minutes of the, of the second half that it just you, you got to get into a rhythm i think i think you guys are right uh so i'm not questioning that i just the losing streak the the drop from 10th ranked in the country to out of the tournament right now is much more than him playing Carl Sharon. Oh minutes. yeah. Yeah. That's not the only reason it's just, there's a zillion reasons and we've gone over probably three fourths of a zillion reasons. Right. And the other right. fourths we're not quite sure of, but um, you, you can't pinpoint it on one thing. I mean, Penny Hardaway was the one who brought up the whole, um, uh, Playing too many bigs too much point has cost them during the that cost them during the streak. Um, and you know it was it's it's a spot on observation. Um, yeah. But you can't none of us are nobody can 
pinpoint one thing. It's it's just it's so many different things. But when but when you just ma- I used well in the headline there was the word presto. When you just magically turn it on for eight minutes and you go okay now that looks like an NCAA tournament team. Forget about who the opponent is. Just those five on the floor playing the way they were. They were playing like they look like an NCAA tournament team when they were anything but prior to that. Like like it's just the 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 gap is so wide and it's like how do you just magically fill it no you're right i mean that was the best we've seen in a while we'll see moving forward starting with temple on thursday how stubborn penny is if he is stubborn will he roll with that does he acknowledge that does he realize that this is my best bet to get us back on track and make a beeline to the tournament or is he going to go back to mixing and matching and trying different combinations. Obviously, that experimental game against Rice backfired in his in his face. But here we go. We have eight games remaining, or is it nine? Is it it's nine? It's nine games. Nine games. Nine. nine games remaining in the regular season. And we'll go back to what you said, Barth, and I think you're spot on. This team can't afford to lose – forget about losing the game at home. But they can't afford to lose a road game at East Carolina, lose at Temple. The only thing I see, and you guys can tell me if you agree or not, I think, Parth, you do, Florida Atlantic on the road in Boca. That's it to me. That is, I think they have to go 8-1 and one and then get to the conference championship or tournament championship game, and I think they'll get in as an at-large even if they lose that game. I think anything short, they're going to come up short. Parth, and then we'll go to Tim on your reaction to that. Yeah, I think you're just about spot on, but I would even expand it a little bit. I'm not saying they have too much room to play with, but Florida Atlantic and Boca, right, on March 9th, or SMU next week, or I guess it'd be um, not this Sunday, but next Sunday in Dallas. I think either one of those, if you drop them and you still go 8-1, and one, I think you're you're looking good. Right, um, if they'd be, it'd be uh, Florida Atlantic in Boca, you can replace it with a loss at SMU is what you're saying. Correct, correct. Eight and one with that loss being either, and I think I'll even throw in North Texas, right? Either Florida Atlantic in Boca Raton, SMU in Dallas, or North Texas in Denton. So I think, you know, either one of those three, and you should be fine. I feel like even just, it sounds crazy, even just winning at this point isn't quite enough. You look at the computer numbers and they look horrific, man. Like, I think last time I checked, they were down to 77 or 80 in Ken Palm, you know, in that same neighborhood in the net. Uh, you know, it's not it's not an exact cookie cutter fit, but you look back just historically last year, the the lowest ranked Ken Palm team to get at large was Nevada and they were 62. So that's almost a 20 point you know difference between where Nevada was at the end of the year and where Memphis is now. And that's just because like they're playing around with these crappy opponents, right? Like they. Um, We're still down 14 to Wichita, despite winning. Uh, They barely beat Tulsa. They barely beat UTSA, went to overtime at home against UTSA. Um, All that stuff has, you know, put a big dent, not only, you know, um, in the resume, the losses have certainly, but then the second part of it is the analytics stuff. So you've got the big dent in the resume because you took those four huge losses and you've got a dent now also in your, you know, your computer numbers. So you've got to go eight and one. And you got to make some of these look convincing, starting with Temple um, here on Thursday. First, um, I appreciate the emphaticness with which Art said Denton. That was very strong, <laughs> Denton. Um, secondly, I envision Parth is kind of like, you know, the stockbroker guy in in Manhattan where he's got all the computer screens up and he's watching the market go up and down and the NASDAQ and the S&P 500 and all that, except his is all all like, you know, basketball rankings i right. envision that in parts downtown memphis estate and thirdly i agree with everything you said in your setup greg except i'm going to add the caveat all of that eight and one with the loss only being on the road to florida atlantic and you get to the championship game you get in even if you lose and the caveat is as long as the team that beats you in the in the championship game is not somebody other than FAU. Good point. Because if somebody steals the automatic bid mm-hmm. and it is a two bid league, at this point it's going to FAU unless FAU crumbles down the stretch, not to Memphis. And I don't know if it's a two bid league, but I'm pretty sure if it gets to that point, it's probably not a three bid league. 
for a I while, would. every bit league, right? Like, but like even during the the skid, you know, not after four losses, obviously, but after Memphis took that first loss to South Florida, you look at the bracketology projections from you know from Jerry Palm from Joe Lenardi, and you know I think one of them at least had it as a three bid league with. I think they had Charlotte, you know, winning the the league with FAU and Memphis being the um, kind of at large teams. Yeah, they they did they did early because Memphis yeah. and Florida Atlantic were both solidly in the top twenty five. Their right. numbers were good, so it made sense, and they would just take away a team from some other league. But that's not going to be the case now. I, I think yeah. Tim's spot on. And uh, and the the even the the Wichita State win wasn't an impressive win. It was an impressive eight minutes, but. I think the first 32 left more of an impression on some of those national guys that actually watched it than the last eight. I just don't remember in years past really having to emphasize the margin of victory in basketball. I know it's part of the net makeup, Ken Palm's makeup, but for all the years you and I, Tim, have been covering basketball and sports, I, I just I don't remember. It's like you get a dub, you get a dub. Now it's all about how you win, how you look in winning, the margin. It's a whole different yeah. ballgame now. It used to be just a football thing. It used to be just a football thing. Absolutely right. So what do you think, guys? The chances right now are going 8-1. and one. I mean, it's got to be very low, right, Parth? Yeah. I mean, John Martin on his radio show likes to bring up the, you know, the Bar Torvik, another analytic site, Um and, and that website's kind of percentage chance of Memphis making the NCAA tournament as an at-large team. And I think it's it's less than 5%. I got to go back and look, but it is not very high. Certainly less than 10, if not less than 5. So, you know, it, it's, it's not looking good from that perspective. From what I see, you know, forget the computers, forget the math. I just haven't seen enough, man, from this team that suggests that they can go out and beat, you know, SMU, North Texas, Florida Atlantic, and Florida Atlantic again. Obviously, they don't have to win all four of those. But like, what have we seen in the past, I don't know, past month, over a month, that gives us any confidence that they can even win three out of four? And if you don't win three out of four, you're not getting an at-large. Right, Tim? I think the chances of Memphis being excited come NCAA tournament time is 100%. Because even if the Tigers aren't in the tournament, there are going to be NCAA tournament games played in Memphis. So that's something to get excited about, right? <laughs> I was like, you th- I was confused. I, I hate to go down this road, but do you think, Parth, if they did not get in the tournament, got the NIT invite, that they would pass on it? It's it's hard to say for sure because I, you know, obviously that hasn't come up in press conferences with players um, or or Penny, but it just seems like. From what we've been able to gather about the personality, about the mental makeup of this team to this point through these 20, what, 22 games now, it seems like they would pass, right? Like, you know, even if they've gotten over that that hump of, of conflict of whatever, chemistry issues, from, from what Penny was saying, it just painted a picture of guys who thought at times maybe they were a little bit too good. Does, does that kind of make sense? Mm-hmm. And when cops are like that, I can't imagine – them wanting to uh, forego or, or pass over time they could be using to get ready for a pro career, whether it be overseas or, you know, the NBA to spend it playing what they deem to be meaningless NIT games. So if they got that bid, that invitation, I think they, they may very well decline it. Also, maybe it shouldn't be so shocking if they go on a run with what has happened this season, going back to the summer, Going back to the Mikey Williams drama, was DeAndre Williams going to be a part of the team? Players leaving, Jordan Brown coming back, the great start, 10th ranked in the nation, all of a sudden dropping off the face of the earth. I guess, Barth, it wouldn't be shocking to anybody if they went belly up or went 8-1 and one or 9-0 and oh and rolled into the NCAA tournament. Man, nothing surprises me anymore. And and Penny has a, hit, Penny has a history, you know, to his credit of being able to – you know, make these 180 type flips just when you think this, you know, his teams are dead in the water. Here they go. And then they make a run. And, you know, if you're, if you're an optimist, if you're looking at it from a glass half full perspective, there's no world beaters here in this conference. Like even Florida Atlantic is vulnerable. They lost to freaking Florida Gulf coast and, and Bryant at home, Bryant at home, Florida Gulf coast on the road, obviously, but you know, it's a beatable basketball team, SMU, another beatable basketball team. So even the opportunities that are quadrant one, so to speak, for Memphis are, are gettable. We're not talking about UConn or Purdue or, or North Carolina here. We're not talking about any of those teams. So, yeah, yeah that's, 
that, that's a great point because people are looking at the conference and seeing some gaudy conference records out of Charlotte and South Florida. And they're thinking that that means necessarily equates to them being good. No, it equates to that. There's a lot of mediocrity in the conference because when you look at their non-conference schedule, nobody really has big wins other than what we thought were big wins for Memphis against big names. They end up not being as big as we thought. But certainly you got a Virginia team that held Miami last night to, what, 39 points? 38 points. 38 Man, points. And Memphis beat them by 1,000. So that's, <laughs> what, uh, that's what drives you crazy watching and following this Tigers team. Yeah. Great, I'll, give last word. I'll, give, I'll Go ahead, Mark. Yeah, I was just saying that's, that's a good point. I think, um, you know, with, with Clemson looking like a team that's going to get in and Virginia rallying to get in, Texas A&M still being on the bubble, if those three teams fall on the right side of the bubble – Um, I think the committee looks at that as well, right? Like when it's kind of on the fence about a team, they say, okay, this team has beaten these three teams who are in our field already. You know, they might look at that and say, okay, the Tigers are deserving of also being in that field of 68. Oh, they're supposed to look at everything. Sam, I'll give you the the final word here. Obviously, we have weeks to go with these podcasts as far as talking about if they don't make it, what an epic failure it is, or the great comeback that they made from looking to be down and out. So there's a lot of story still to be written but uh your final thoughts here for this week you know i was joking last week about um while they're in the midst of the the tigers are in the midst of the losing streak about how um the conference must be better than everybody talked about it was because memphis is dropping one game after another but it obviously is more toward what you're saying it's and that makes the games that they did lose that much more impactful because they were losing to teams they had no business losing two on paper. Right. Um, But to your point, with all that being said, they still look like a team that could go on a run. I mean, it's not out of the question or they, the alternative, they still look like a team that could go on another four game losing streak. It's like, you don't know what's going to happen. And part of it depends on just, you know, who's, who's doing and saying what on, on any given day. It's, it's really, Excuse me. It's 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 just it, it's a it's a who knows team. You're right. I mean, I still look at this team, even though they've struggled the way they have. Are they one of the 68 best teams in the country? I I still think they are because they're capable on any night. I think so to too. Beat anybody, right? But it, it's the entire resume. It's what have you done for me lately? There's a lot of things that come into play. So it is going to be absolutely interesting the rest of the way. Of course, Parth will have you covered uh, with the Tigers uh, day to day. He'll be heading to Philadelphia for the Temple game on Thursday. Then Super Bowl Sunday, it's the 1 o'clock game, as the Tigers will look for their revenge against the Tulane Green Wave. Parth, as always, thank you so much. Safe travels to Philadelphia. We'll talk to you next week. I appreciate it. Fun as always. Tim, it's always great to catch up with you, my friend. Appreciate it, Greg. Parth, have a good chicken Philly cheese thing. Will do. Enjoy those for me as well. Folks, be sure to check out our other podcasts here at the Daily Memphian. The Daily Memphian's food podcast, Sound Bites, is hosted by Chris Harrington and Holly Whitfield. The Sidebar with Eric Barnes is about arts, culture, and everything in between. And the Grizzlies podcast, also hosted by Chris Harrington with Drew Hill. All of our podcasts are available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you find podcasts. Big thanks to Natalie Van Gundy for producing once again. We'll talk to you again next week.